So welcome everyone to the industry panel of Vein. I am uh, Helena Holmström Olsson, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to today's industry panel as part of Vein. So most welcome all of you. This industry panel has an aim and a focus, and I'm truly honored to be able to be the moderator of this panel. We wish to together discuss and learn from industry best practice on a number of different topics with regards to AI engineering and its associated challenges. All intention with this panel is to together build uh, a community around AI engineering where, of course, the collaboration and the communication between industry and academia is key. And so there are a different of, uh, number of different topics that we hope to explore with our panelists today, uh, including what is required from industry to build successful AI applications, the whole transition from prototypes to production quality systems, the challenges, and of course, what is next. So what are the things that uh, research should focus on? I am very happy to welcome our four panelists. We have Roland Weiss from ABB. We have Alexander Fabian from Microsoft. We have Elena Feshman from Ericsson and KTH. We have Björn Brinne from Peltarion. They will have the opportunity to introduce, introduce themselves in more detail in just a little bit. But before the round of introductions, I would just want to take you a few, uh, few uh, through a few set of slides just to set the scene for this panel. So some of you were in the conference yesterday where we talked about AI engineering and you may have seen a research agenda that me and John and Ivica presented. And so with AI engineering, and this is just as a background setting, what we mean is a discipline concerned with all aspects of, so running from development also to the evolution of AI systems. So the practices and the agenda that we showed yesterday basically outline a space based on our research, our experiences, primarily in the, you could say embedded systems domain, but also many other company domains where we have identified a set of challenges. Many of these challenges were also touched upon in the many great presentations yesterday, ranging from the data management uh, challenges, the importance of quality, the training, the retraining, the deployment, the design development process. So a, a quite broad range of different challenges that were touched upon in the presentations and something that also we see. And this is of course where we would like to learn more and also explore how the different companies mitigate and manage these challenges. Uh, as part of our research, we also presented this in, in one of our papers where we basically outline how we see companies move from more of the experimentation and prototyping of these technologies towards actual deployment. And this transition is where we see lots of activity in the prototyping stage, but a true challenge in also getting these systems successfully deployed. And the further you move towards deployment, the more of the AI engineering, so the surrounding processes and methods you actually need to make these components work in a larger system. So that's something that we are, of course, extremely interested in learning more about. And then as my final slide, I would want to show you this because what I, what I feel is very interesting from more of a large scale system perspective is that we have very many different approaches of development that need to basically coexist. So you will have the regulatory fe features for which requirements driven development practices are relevant. You will have the more innovative features where you don't really know the optimal alternative of development, but you need to really try out, you need to test, you need to evaluate your hypotheses. And it's, this is where the more data-driven development practices such as A-B testing comes into play. And then you have the more AI-driven development practices where you use AI technologies to help you, for example, minimize prediction errors, uh, help you 
go through large data sets and really make use of these technologies to help you achieve things you didn't achieve before. But the interesting thing is that these will be present in a large scale system at the same time, as well as these large scale systems exist in big organizations where different ways of working and processes, for example, the more uh, MLOps or the DevOps practices need to coexist with maybe a more traditional waterfallish approach. So there are many aspects to this and also something that we can hopefully touch a bit upon since we do foresee a future where all of these components will be subject to uh, continuous deployment and we will get data back from the field from all of these components in one way or the other. So there are huge potentials and opportunities. For the panel, my hope is to have as an interactive session as possible in this format. So you are all invited to ask questions to our panelists. Use the chat and type any question, comment or reflection in this chat. And then my job is to direct them to our panelists in the best way possible. So that was the thinking. And from here, I will hand over and have the panelists introduce themselves. And if I remember correctly, I think I put Roland Weiss in, first in my list. So please, Roland, say a few words about yourself. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Helena, for the introduction. And a little bit about myself. I'm with ADB now more than 15 years. Uh, I started uh, working around um, AI, ML, when ABB started the journey towards more autonomous systems, and uh, I was running the research organization by then. Um, this was around six years ago, uh, pretty much in line with the advent of, of uh, really uh, large-scale deployment of AI and ML in, in more industrial settings. And since two years, I'm responsible for the automation product, the development of our automation products um, in ABB. So going from research uh, to actually application of uh, ML. And um, where we have been using um, model uh, learning and, and uh, various other technologies is in um, decision support for uh, plants. So plants can be better manufacturing, offshore uh, sites, uh, water desalination, so very different domains, very different applications, but there is a lot of automation going on. So reading data from sensors, processing the data, and then doing something intelligent with it, controlling the process as well as uh, doing interaction and some supervision. So this, this is a little bit the, the range of applications we, we talk about. Maybe also interesting to say is that this core process control um, is uh, where we have 10 to, man, uh, 10 to 100 milliseconds response times from something uh, indicated uh, deviation in the process where then we have to react and the process has to update and we need to control the process. So this is the range, the core process control the supervision goes from seconds when an operator needs to react to an alarm uh, to months when we have uh, cycles of assets, uh, uh, repair cycles, optimizing those. These are the things that, that uh, we are working on. So this is a little bit uh, range and maybe one last word about myself. I'm working in automation domain, which is heavily influenced by engineers, but I'm a computer scientist by education. So. So far about myself, I hand back over to you, Helena. Thank you very much, Roland, for that excellent introduction. And, and we are very happy to have you here in the panel. So most welcome. Mm -hmm. Then we move on to someone who you could say have an early start or a very late night. So welcome, Alexander, calling in from Seattle. Hi, everyone. Um, it is a good morning here. To, um, my name is Alex, and I'm a data scientist at Microsoft. Uh, in particular, at Microsoft Experimentation Platform Team EXP, um, our team is uh, responsible for developing and operating one of the largest A-B testing platforms on the planet. Um, we essentially help many different Microsoft teams run a online controlled experiments, also known as A-B tests, uh, so they can make informed decisions on which features provide value to customers. 
Um, for those of you who are not familiar with A-B testing, this is you know, a very common technique in large-scale software companies to expose two different versions of the product to customers and determine which one really works better for them. Um, I have a PhD in computer science. In fact, I, I, I did my PhD in Sweden and joined Microsoft, uh, I think it's been almost three years ago. Uh, I've been working with this team all the time. Um, just like you know, in any other parts of AI, uh, data is you know, very important aspects of A-B testing as well. So I'm looking forward today to discuss the many different aspects of uh, AI, in particular, how data is important for making informed decisions. Um, with that, I'm gonna give it right back to you, Helena, to make sure that other participants are also introduced. Thank you so much, Alexander, and thank you for calling in. Uh, even despite the hour of day. So, uh, mm -hmm. Elena, next. Most yes, welcome. thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm a computer scientist as well. Uh, I'm, um, I'm with Ericsson, so I'm leading the Ericsson research uh, team on artificial It's a global team uh, with researchers in many countries. Uh, and then I'm also an adjunct professor at KTH in cyber physical systems. And uh, my background and my PhD that I did many, many years ago, uh, it was uh, essentially about uh, formal methods and engineering and uh, uh, quite a bit about embedded systems and uh, real time systems. And then since then, I was gradually moving into cyber physical systems and AI. So it's a mix. So my interest is in this mix, really. Uh, Ericsson is a fantastic company, you know, because it's super complex. Uh, we like complex systems, right? When we are at research, uh, we, we are researchers. Uh, so kind of to, to make an optimal uh, 5G architecture or 6G architecture, it's very challenging. Or maybe, you know, taking care of uh, intelligent automation of the services where actually Ericsson is running more than 1 billion subscribers. So it's kind of a big operator in itself because it's running for other operators. Uh, then, I, as I said, I'm at KTH part-time. Uh, it's been uh, five years since I became a junk professor there. Uh, and my interest is really in the, you know, in interplay and cooperation between research and industry. I have this burning interest in that. So I'm looking forward to this panel. Thank you. Privilege to have you here. So most welcome, Elena. And then finally, Björn Brinne, welcome. Thank you. So Björn Brinne, my name. Uh, I work with Peltarion since almost five years. Peltarion uh, builds uh, technology to make AI available to all companies. Uh, we, we find that coming out to companies that try to adopt AI, that there's, as a data scientist, there's always a gap between and that it's this lack of understanding of the specific domain and the domain experts' lack of understanding of how AI can be, can be helping them. So trying to make tools that enable the domain experts to create value with AI themselves. So my role has been building up and leading the data science and machine learning specialists team. And that's partly research in how to operationalize AI, so they're relevant here, partly supporting our product development uh, but also being out speaking to companies. So I have quite a lot of insight into to what companies do when they try to approach AI. And my personal background is I, I got interested in machine learning and AI in, when I was in high school uh, in the mid 80s, reading popular science journals, trying to re-implement things. Um, but then I did a small detour into theoretical physics and computational biology, where I did my PhD and, and some research. Uh, I've been in data science in industry the past 15 years working with machine learning, partly analytics, a lot, and lots of different things. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Thank you, all of you. And then uh, I will start with a few warm-up questions. But at the same time, I also want to encourage people listening in in the audience to really make use of the chat for anything that comes to mind. But I think I will make use of what you said, Bjorn, uh, because in your uh, introduction here, you mentioned that you have been, you know, companies approach AI in very many different things and you have to build up some kind of 
organization or competence on how to approach this when, when introducing the development of these components into your organization. And that, I think, for me, connects a little bit to what I shared with you, like, what is it, what is required? How do you go about when, when preparing yourself and your company and your organization? And what approach to, to building AI systems do you take? So any reflections from your end on, on this, on how to actually approach the building of AI systems? And I can direct, but someone could also wave if you feel really eager to respond. And to this, maybe Roland goes first because he also introduced uh, himself. Maybe, Leon should maybe give the start, but uh, when, when he talked, I, I felt immediately the urge to talk to him afterwards. So, <laughs> maybe I can give a quick quick start from my end. So, um, one one topic I had on, on my list to mention here immediately was that what is important to us is the scalability of software engineering with ML and scalability not in terms of performance and the more but in creating those models. What we have seen in, in early pilots is if we equip a plant with some intelligence, we have thousands of assets that need dedicated models to identify when is the next uh, repair necessary or where should we replace this equipment. And creating those models with domain experts that understand the process is a huge challenge for us. I mean, in, in the workshop so far, we, had, we heard very great approaches how to build those systems with software engineers, with data scientists, with ML experts. We have domain experts that need to do this on site and uh, tune this so that it really works for this specific plant, for this specific application. So this is a huge need for us, the, the scalability and tools that can be used by domain experts, not uh, by data scientists, software architects, and so on. So we have them, of course, to support them. But uh, the majority of the models should be easy to generate, easy to debug and diagnose, so, and then, of course, to deploy. So this is the focus where we would need much more support than we get today. Mm -hmm. Any comment from your end, Bjorn, since I picked up on your little... Thank you. Yes, no, no, technology for sure is a huge blocker. But I think even more, uh, coming out and speaking to domain experts, is and the lack of understanding of what AI is and can do for them. So trying to teach people the basics of sort of experiment-driven development is something that I see as a huge need. And it, it comes back to what, what you just said, Roland, that, that actually having the domain experts, they are the experts on everything, regardless of how tightly you try to define the thing that you want the data scientist team to solve, there's always going to be aspects of what they come up with that is obviously not the perfect thing for the domain experts. So having them tightly involved and preferably doing it themselves, I see as a huge opportunity. I saw Elena's hand, and then I'm going to ask Alexander to chime in as well. But Elena, please. I'll chime in on this. Uh, I think it's a super interesting topic. I think we are in a transition phase still. I mean, and there is, a, of course, uh, a need for this type of activities where you kind of mix the domain competence where AI competence, maybe, or the competence of how to build these systems, like in a good way, how do, do we do that? I mean, at Ericsson, it's super um, kind of uh, visible that, uh, you know, there is a, a amazing radio competence. I mean, the 5G system is super complex, and I mean, how to build antennas. And then we are tapping in AI competence on how to make this infrastructure utilization in the best way, for example. And that is... Uh, period also if it's deeper rooted because we how we are educating people because previously uh, we are not uh, I mean if you're you're either computer scientist or you're radio engineer there, there is no mix and now we are educating all our domain experts across the company in AI so there is like an activity we have uh, okay I have my organization that's AI research and we in, we are AI researchers mainly uh, with some radio competence so it's always a mix but actually educating experts, educated domain experts. This is kind of uh, something that's been ongoing in the company. It's like, and it takes time. It's because it's a cultural change. And uh, also, I mean, you need to set aside the time and invest mm. this time to educate all the domain experts to mix it in a good way. Thanks a lot. And I was going to ask you, I happen to know, I mean, Alexander, you did spend some time on actually, now you're in, a, in an organization where I could imagine 
that the experimental ways of working is the default ways of working uh, to a large extent. But I also happen to know that you have some experience on how to bring those practices to more of the traditional domains and industries. So maybe you would want to say a few words on how to actually make this mindset happen and how to also make it evolve, even if you have it from the start. I, I think there's there's two aspects of, of, of this question. One of them is like, sh you need to bring the, the, the knowledge, the expertise on developing AI systems to the domain experts, which is something that we've just discussed right now. Um, but there's also the other aspect, which is how do we extract the knowledge that the domain experts have that we can use in building intelligent systems, right? So uh, I think we already covered that first part a little bit, but I wanna, I wanna touch the second one a little bit more um, because in my view, the AI systems, they are really, they are very similar to how humans work, right? As humans, we use some knowledge and some prior history to make informed decisions about some goal. Um, and AI systems do exactly the same, if you think about it, right? There is some goal that someone came up with, and there is some data and an algorithm that tries to, you know, guide uh, the direction towards optimizing that goal. Um, now, the key thing here is that, you know, those three things, algorithms, you know, data and goal, and here is where the domain experts come in place. When you're really building like large scale systems, like the notion of what is your goal, what is the metrics, that the product metrics that you're optimizing for, they are really important. Um, and in my view, like when we have domain experts that already know a lot about the domain, the key thing to do is to make sure that they are involved in building this third aspects of the goal, the metrics that any algorithm or any idea that we're gonna be testing through experiments in any other way, uh, we'll be optimizing for. Um, so my chime in here is just, um, you know, it's not only about, you know, educating experts and uh, domain experts and bringing them the knowledge of AI, but it's really also getting their knowledge of domain expertise bundled into what will be the goal, the metrics that we're going to be optimizing for uh, through various A-B tests and disciplines. Um, and so, since you ask about bringing all this into the companies, I hope that we will touch uh, a little bit of the notion of a flywheel today. Um, this is one of my favorite topics to always discuss. It's all about slow incremental progress, not big breakthroughs that happen overnight. Great, Alexander. And uh, I think you bring up a very important uh, challenge regardless of what we are actually talking about. And that comes down to this whole notion of what is it that we are optimizing for? Uh, which is, uh, I think, an important discussion in itself. But I will pick up on the chat because we have two people uh, interacting with us. And one of the questions actually touch upon this when asking, uh, how do you actually work? Is this done in multidisciplinary teams with software engineers and data scientists? So if you reflect a little bit on that, and then I will move into more of the challenges part because we also have a questions related to to the challenges that comes with this. But anyone want to comment on how, how do things look like today? Are there these multidisciplinary teams? Elena, you can start. So it, it, uh, I, I can say, yes, we do work in multidisciplinary teams. That would be a short answer. But uh, like if I dive in into the details slightly. Uh, so there are so many different uh, flavors. I, I, can, I can share how uh, AI at Ericsson looks like. We do have research organization that's five years ahead. Then we have AI accelerator that's scaling up kind of uh, the, the findings from Ericsson research. And then we have the product organizations that are here and now. So it all depends on what kind of level of maturity of the project is. When you're developing something novel, uh, in essence, it comes, typically it comes from a uh, customer need or needs of society somewhere. And then it comes kind of uh, and getting evaluated what type of mix do we need to have? Uh, is it like a, a bit longer term project Then probably it's uh, researchers that jump on that together with domain experts. Uh, sometimes even with kind of with those with problem owners kind of what could be a customer need or something, or it is more here and now and then maybe it's not researchers, but maybe it's uh, data engineers and data scientists together with domain knowledge. But it's always a mix. Um, 
it's it's great if uh, we have this mix in in one person when it's like good understanding of a some T shaped. Okay, we know we know, all know T shaped engineers, right? It's always good with that, but it's not always you have them. So it's evaluated and varies, of course. And what would you say with regards to ABB, Roland? Yeah, I mean, I can also give the short answer, yes, but yeah. uh, <laughs> elaborate a little bit more. We have a very simple framework, four steps. We start with the business value, what Elena called the needs, and that is typically a business owner, really a business person, a business-focused person that drives, says, okay, this is an opportunity if we have provide this kind of functionality in our systems, that provides value to our customers, sometimes to society, depending on what we are doing. The next step is then engaging with people that operate the site and uh, know their automation. So how to get access to the data, what kind of data, understand who owns which part of the data, because there are customers, there is automation companies like us. I mean, the, the uh, notion of uh, the data ownership is, is very important in this case. But after that, then we involve the data scientists, the software engineers that actually build the system. And the last step is then deployment, make it operational. And you see through this chain, and typically the, the long part is the first two steps, defining what we want to do and getting access, curating the data and, and all that. And then building the system is typically the, the smaller thing. Uh, but uh, it's, it's teams of uh, business owners, domain experts, automation experts, software engineers, ML experts. So it's really bringing all this together. And I mean, ABB and Ericsson are both companies of uh, Scandinavian roots. So we have a similar setup. It's also a complex company with research, very similar setup in terms of research, transitioning to the uh, product units, etc. So that's, that's uh, what, what we also see in our case. And I guess, Bjorn, you might see a bit of a, a different mix since you work with many different companies as well. Absolutely. So first, I'd like to say that it, it would be great if we could have T-shaped engineers everywhere. Uh, but of course, that's very hard. Uh, so, and I, I see some companies really trying to get that, to take all the domain experts and train them to code Python, which I think in some cases might work, but in many, many cases probably won't be the most effective way. Um, but I, I also like what, what you said, Roland, uh, about the, um, if, if you have the domain experts or the problem owners starting to define the problem, and then once you once you see the opportunity and you know what you want to do with it, that's when you bring in the developers to actually build it. So getting people that have enough understanding to see opportunities that aren't just about sort of changing or improving on the way we do things now, but actually changing it different, so making it kind of a different thing. So opportunities that, that you wouldn't have thought of unless you had enough understanding of, of the potential of AI is something that I see a lot in, in these discussions. When, when we come into a company and we have long sessions with them, um, having discussions on the data they have, surely an AI can do something useful with this, or we just want to automate this. Those two are very hard to go with. Uh, so having a deeper discussion where you actually understand the problems and trying to find opportunities for things that they hadn't thought of is the happy outcome that we end up with sometimes. So, so that's something that I'm always trying to strive for, finding, giving them enough understanding to come up with these ideas and us being sort of the bouncing off ideas partner to, to figure out what makes sense to do. Do you have a short reflection on this, Alexander? Um, I'm just, just going to add that I've seen many different models, um, you know, but whichever model is chosen, it's, but the important thing is to always have like the, the clear goal in mind as of how far we're going to go. Like if it's maybe just a data scientist doing a proof of concept, that's the intent. You should, you know, tell that in a project ahead, this is going to be proof of concept. We're not developing a, you know, a real product. That's fine. Um, but the the models that I've seen work best is when there really is a you know a uh, an interdisciplinary team that has both engineers, product managers, or domain experts as well, as well as data scientists on the team uh, pushing the project forward. Um, that's one of the most successful outcomes. The data scientists will know which algorithms and data to look at, whereas the engineers will tell you which contracts and which specifics to, you know, to access it from, um, as well as all the other concerns that you know, the other parties will not be aware of. Yeah. We have a couple of questions from Ivica in the chat, and I will pick his second one since I think it relates quite nicely to this discussion. So 
the question reads as follows. From my communication, uh, my experience is that AI and data scientists work extremely bottom up, looking at data and finding out what can be done. Development of complex systems dominates by a top down approach. And then the question is, how is it in your organizations or what is your experience with regards to this uh, mismatch, you could say? Anyone wants to start reflecting on this top down versus bottom up? Is that something that you have experienced so far? Bjorn? Sure, sure. I, I've seen both. Um, so data scientists sometimes want to start with just give me the data and then I'll figure out what to do with it. But that's not that's not always the case. But when it comes to the companies that we speak to or the, the, the uh, uh, problem owners, so to say, they, there's two different aspects. There's the ones that say we have a lot of data, put some data scientists in it and bring us some value. And then there are the ones that are much more on the sort of these are the things we try to solve. Do we have the data already? Can we find some way of collecting the data? Is there already some data out there that we can make use of to bring value to, to this process that we're trying to improve on? And, and I think that, that maybe that's something we should go to later on because that's going to be more a longer discussion, but on the data and the continuous updating of these models and how that works, so the, more the AI engineering side of things that is completely different from normal engineering where you Sort of you start always, you have a clear scope, and once you've built it, you're done. With, with AI, the world is changing, the models are changing, the data is changing, so figuring out ways to adapt that, make the model or the system adapt to the changes over time, and being effective and, and clever with how you use the data, what data you choose to annotate, and so on, is something that I think is going to be very important once you move from POC to actual production and the AI engineering stuff. Yes, yeah. And that was actually brought up as part of the introduction yesterday, this whole transition from the more requirements driven toward the more exploratory. And that's, this is, of course, one, one part of this. Elena wants to go next. I, um, um, I'll bring some kind of philosophical angle to this, I think, because as I said, I feel like we're in this transition. And uh, what I've seen before is that I mean, it's a mix, but uh, very often, uh, say like five years back, uh, when we were not super data driven, uh, when it was like, uh, there was, it was a lot of top down, uh, at and when we started, you know, uh, we had like 40,000 people working on resolving trouble tickets manually. Uh, and then there was a very clear top down request. Uh, we need to automate. We need to automate like crazy. We are automating first line support. We are automating second line support. We are automating quite a bit of back office. So that's a clear task. Uh, and then in that clear task, we were kind of, let's see what we can get, what kind of data is there. So let's connect to as much data as much. So obviously there are different knowledge bases and there is like, uh, there are many different sites where you have resolved similar issues. It's like, it's not even AI, it was some kind of, uh, uh, data, data science methods that we used for that. But that was a clear, uh, but that, that's probably because we have this transition. Now, if you think of how it should look like ideally in the ideal world, like let's say t five years from now, let's assume that all these data sources are there. I mean, whatever data source is out there. I mean, it's not like this today, I can assure you because have our uh, systems that don't, don't have so much observability. I am dying for observability. I want to have more observability. So hopefully five years from now, we have clear observability. It's all integrated in our data lakes. And then I just want to have this top down requests like, okay, let's see if we can optimize this. Let's see if we can optimize that. But now it's really, yeah, it's a mix. I like the notion of the ideal world in five years from now, Elena. <laughs> I would want that too. <laughs> um, Roland. Yeah. And, and for me, even in our previous uh, discussion, I was thinking, yes, I mean, we, we have, oh, I mentioned this nice process. We start with business value and then we go through different steps and then we have the perfect uh, ML enabled uh, system in place. But uh, most of the time, it's not as easy as that. And it's, it's really also people need to understand what are the limits and what are the capabilities of this of this new technology. And uh, I mean, if it's a road, there is there is a hype, and the hype is creating expectations uh, 
inflated expectations often. So, and, and it's really a kind of back and forth, right? So bringing requests, but then also um, with the business owner understanding, okay, what is actually possible today with what we have and what we can create and kind of calibrating expectations. I mean, I remember it was three years ago, we had one of our yearly um, technology events and we had a person that was running the uh, AI for one of the premium German car makers. And uh, he was saying in two years, we have, will have these autonomous cars everywhere. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, uh, it's a little, there was this uh, excitement everywhere that everything can be automated. And uh, I think it's, it's really more augmenting, supporting, decision support. So uh, these kind of uh, understandings have to go both from the technology side as well as from the business side and bring this together. So for me, it's really back and forth. It needs to come top down and bottom up. Both needs need to work together. So that, that's for me really important. And I mean, once once things are really mature and understood and fully settled, then uh, we need to drive it more top down. Mm -hmm. Alexander, do you want to add? Just just second what has already said here. Um, a hybrid approach is something that I've seen most successful, uh, where you have the the domain knowledge experts or the product owners going and trying to understand a little bit about you know what we have today on the technology side, what data is out there, what what is feasible, and then on the same time having the you know the science and engineering side understand the business problem. Um, those kind of models they have been, in my view, the most successful, uh, mm -hmm. where there's a tight collaboration and there's focus on, on finding the, the middle ground between what's feasible and, and what's actually has some business value. Um, when it only comes from different sides, I've, I've seen uh, nice explorative projects, which don't typically lead into like um, something that is, a, you know, a really awesome outcome, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. So thank you. And I would want to, I'm going to try to connect a few of the questions that appeared in the chat so far, because one thing that all of you brought up, as well as the people in the audience, is the challenge of data. And Bjorn, you mentioned this ex explicitly in the sense that, you know, this continuous data coming into our system, the continuous changes, the continuous updates, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have one question uh, that relates to the requirement engineering for data quality attributes. How do you ensure that the training and test data sets have the right quality and properties? And then there is another question related to, mm -hmm. so it's not only the continuous data management, but also the continuous development and deployment of these machine learning models. So the continuous practices relate to, to both the data and the machine learning component. And if I ask you to reflect on, we could start with the data challenge, maybe. Huge topic, but still, uh, let's try to grab it a little bit. Who would want to start and saying something about the data quality aspects? Alexander, all about data. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, is, it is the fundamental component of any intelligence system. So getting data right, is it is the hardest challenge we've and at least personally, I've seen in any practical problem that needs uh, intelligence on it. So uh, we could probably go, you know, and have a very long conversation about getting data ready and clean. But at the end of the day, I, when I think about it, I like to split it into two aspects. Is it of high quality and can it be changed easily? Um, I'll give you some examples for each, right? So like, Anytime you look at data, there is going to be missing value. There's going to be null values. There's going to be duplicates. There's going to be all sorts of data quality issues that, that you have to look into and, you know, and compute, you know, how often do they happen and find ways to mitigate them. So that's all about data cleanliness. Um, so any reliable system will still generate data that we cannot trust. Um, so in any time work with data, you have to always be mindful of Twyman's law which is any number that looks different is probably wrong. Um, so this is a, you know, a good thing to have in mind when you work with data. Um, and then there's just other aspects, which I also mentioned, with, which is easy, easier to change, right? So like 
I think software engineers like to define products, a good good code as of like easy to be adapted and changed for a different purpose. And the same things are still valid with data. Um, as you're building your product and like, you know adding new features, you're going to be adding telemetry. You're going to be adding new data instances to it, um, which essentially means that over time you're going to have to be changing your data logging and data telemetry pipelines um, to to facilitate these new inputs. So an important component of all this is not only that the data is clean, but it, that it is in a schema in a format that you can easily adapt for your next problem, for your next thing that you need to solve, for your next AI algorithm or whatever uh, you're going to be testing in the future. Um, concrete examples is in products, you often have fixed schemas and then you know adapting them either with property backs and, or in some other ways. Um, so they're easy to change in the long term that helps mitigate a lot of the challenges and make the system much more flexible for the problems that you don't know you're gonna be facing in, in a few years from now. Thanks a lot, Alexander. I saw Roland's hand, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm building a little bit on what Alexander said. I fully support everything he said. There, there is one very basic thing that uh, when, when talking about data in our industrial setting, I mean, we, we talk about processes and the time, the causality of an event happening and later on causing certain effects. Everything needs to be timestamped. Uh, uh, pictures, uh, sensor data, audio files, everything needs to be timestamped and this has to be accurate. I mean, I've mentioned that our process control has to be down to the millisecond. So, and uh, that is a challenge. I mean, we, we have uh, GPS systems in some of our sites to give an accurate clock and so on. So. I just wanted to mention, this is one of the key things. But uh, the second thing is, um, for, for me, data and the models that we create of the data have to be versioned, have to be handled like we handle source code, because whatever we deliver, we go through certification for safety, for security, uh, for uh, machinery, uh, rotating equipment, all of this, this, all the regulation that surrounds our industrial products. Um, we have to prove uh, what is exactly on site deployed at the customer. And so we need uh, the, the same rigor we do for source code, we need to, for the models we need for data. So for me, these really are the, the basics. But then what I already touched upon is the, the third dimension is, is really the ownership of data, the, the governance around the data. Um, when, when we interact with customers, we see all kinds of behavior. Some customers come to us take our data, I mean, they even set us data where we need to say, okay, because of compliance, we have to give you back your data. So we have to be very careful in this understanding how to deal with data and to have clear rules, uh, who can access what and uh, anonymize data. Uh, I think we have a long way to go to make this uh, easy and smooth. At the moment, each project is an individual contract and negotiation. And th this also takes a, long, a lot of time and yeah. slows down the innovation cycle. Mm -hmm. Elena, you had, did you want to add? I can add a little bit. I, I totally uh, can confirm this uh, availability of data and reagony. Re uh, negotiation. Re <laughs> renegotiation of pro contracts. <laughs> um, uh, this, this I've seen a lot, uh, absolutely, just to, to be able to use the, to make use of data. But then, of course, uh, when you build something, when you have, I mean, we have our own production lines, we have our own, you know, building this uh, antennas, I mean, the antenna design, there you have a lot of data. So we're kind of uh, using uh, these mechanisms uh, to kind of um, to improve it. But, but the... the um, the tricky part, of course, is that uh, from the start of the design to that it should actually live and you can collect all this data, that's like 10 year cycle. So that is su super tricky. So then, then, and then also you cannot go into live networks and start collecting the data. It's not, it's not like we cannot do like Spotify does. Uh, okay, let's pick a population of people and see how the recommendations are good or bad. Like, let's see, we cannot start tweaking the same uh, in the because there may be like a bus crushing because of that or something. So it's, it's a tricky one, I think, to, to kind of collect the data from live systems. And uh, that is also me. So, so you know, best best simulators, uh, they are super important, I think, for, for them, for good development. 
Mm. Björn, anything from your end on this whole notion of continuous? Um, absolutely. So <clears throat> controlling quality of machine generated data is a mess. Um, we're working now in projects in health where we're trying to understand human generated data or so actually electronic health records. So doctors in a hurry typing things about patients and there's many different doctors typing different things. So understanding the, the differences in how they write and understanding the problems with the labels of that data to be able to make use of it is something that we have an active research project in. So it's very interesting trying to use AI to understand when data has been mislabeled. So AI can come in not only using the data, but also understanding the data. And I think that's going to be a very interesting way of going forward. So I think so you already know about the uh, anomaly detection methods for finding out when your machines go wrong and so on. But, but that's going to be something that needs to be incorporated in the data stages in, in all AI engineering systems in the future, I think. You know, yesterday in several of the press or in some of the presentations, data was mentioned in terms of everything from, you know, this is where magic needs to happen till uh, being a can of worms. So, uh, <laughs> yes, um, we have a question from Per Runeson in the chat where he is curious to learn more about. So the question reads as follows. Have you seen any good examples of tool chain integration from proof of concepts to ML in production? Data scientists tend to work in MATLAB or similar prototyping environments, which cannot be launched in products, typically performance, power consumption, or memory footprints hinder. So if we take that as a bit of a tool slash technical question, any reflections on that one? Yeah, Bjorn? So, so uh, the, the fact that data scientists used to work a lot in, in tools that were not usable when it came to putting things in production, I think is true, but it's also changing with uh, when deep learning has happened, everybody needs, almost everybody needs to start working in Python. So you still get, you get a little bit closer to things that can be in production, but still, if you bring a data scientist working with Python together with a software engineer, who's comfortable with typed uh, languages like Java or something like that, there will always be, be differences and difficulties. But definitely uh, the tooling is merging because of the need to actually make things that work in production. Anyone else? You look, yeah. So if that was the tool part, we also have a question reflecting more on the methods part where you can hear different voices and different attitudes where some people go along the lines, we simply need to use existing methods uh, and educate accordingly. And then on the other hand, you hear people saying, we need completely new methods and techniques. Um, so what is your take on, on this? Where do I start, Elena? Yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, it's just for industrial companies to decide if they want to be a leader of, or to be a follower. And that's actually uh, both are valid. It's not bad to be a follower. It's much easier to, easier to be a follower. Uh, a clear strategy that, that your company wants to be, you know, the best e in some field. Then you need to be on top of the latest and always scan and monitor and actively work with the research community, actively develop and so on. Because it's only that's that's when you your I mean, okay, take telecom networks. This is where they get they get faster. This is when you use their resources in the best way and so on. But then of course it takes uh, it is uh, it it's not an easy thing to be a leader because you all these developments it's it's a costly thing simply. Uh, if you're a follower, then you can just uh, take whatever is there off the shelf. So it's uh, it's two strategies, and both are valid. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, Roland? Yes, I, I can follow up on that. I already mentioned that uh, one of the key challenges for us is the scalable software engineering with ML, and uh, this this is not solved today. So, of course, uh, applying best practices uh, is uh, what what we we are uh, what we need to do. But this, this will not deliver what, what we expect uh, from this uh, introduction of ML in, into our product. So this, this needs to go, go further than that. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this uh, easy, low-code approaches uh, 
to um, model development and uh, that, that is really important. Another aspect is I've mentioned that when, when we create uh, those models for, for assets, they are somewhat similar but always different and uh, kind of uh, creating models with certain variations uh, without the need of uh, uh, full retraining. I mean, this is more an ML problem, not a uh, software engineering problem, but in the end they go hand in hand. So these are the things that we, we need. And uh, uh, next one is I've mentioned the regulations. We need to provide proof and that uh, has to come with trustworthy explainable in the ML. So th there are so many things that are not ready for this scalable software engineering, scalable ML. I mean, it's, of course, we made huge steps the last 10 years, but uh, it's, it's not where we can really roll out uh, in, uh, in scale. Um, so definitely there is a lot of need for research. So <laughs> I would encourage the community to really push forward hard. Thank you for uh, putting your, uh, nailing that one, Roland. I think that whole transition uh, towards uh, production quality uh, deployment is is really what we are looking for. Alexander, do you want to reflect on on this um, ways in which we use methods and what methods to use really? Mm, it, I think it's it, it's again both. Today we have a lot of these mixed answers. Um, so there's both you know existing methods and ways, and they're great in solving you know similar problems. To give an example, there's really a lot of algorithms out there and ways to, to detect if there's a cat on an image, right? There's a cat. There is no cat. It's, I don't need to. Uh, oftentimes, I don't have to, you know, fine tune and reinvent a new algorithm for that problem. But there are problems um, that you know are specific to your product. They're specific to the innovative parts of your product, where you have to continue to invest and find new ways, new models, and new techniques. Um, so it's really about strategically placing new research into areas of the product that matter most for you um, and, you know, filling in the blanks for solvable problems using techniques that are already out there on the other side. Thanks a lot. I do realize that we have about seven minutes and 44 seconds left. I'm actually going to go and pick a question from the very beginning of this session where Ivica asked, what would be the showstopper? Is there like a real showstopper for industry that would make some companies disappear? Because they, because of this showstopper, will not be able to manage AI development. So I would want Bjorn to start reflecting on what would be potential showstoppers that would actually put companies out of business, and then maybe also turn that thing around to comment a little bit on. So what is next? What do you see as the next steps within your businesses to to make this successful? Bjorn, would you mind starting? Yes. So, so what definitely won't work is something that we sometimes see. It's sort of the add AI and stir solution. You already you stick to what you have. You don't think that you need to do more AI. It's just another technology that you put in some team somewhere, and they will bring everything that you need into the company. I don't think that's going to work. You need to have understanding of AI everywhere because it'll affect all processes everywhere. Part, in some parts, it will be small changes. It will be sort of the, the cognitive power tools adding, helping people doing the same thing they're doing. In some cases, it will be changing the processes completely and going from, for, for different things. Next so the, step. Um, next step is education. Uh, definitely, education. Tooling, yeah. tooling is developing. Techniques are developing. If you want to go for the making it easier to code approach or the low code, uh, no code side that, that I'm sort of supporting here, um, doesn't matter. But everybody needs to understand how it makes sense to use AI. Thank you, Bjorn. Elena, your opinion on this showstopper. What is next? Yeah, I would I would call it showstopper is rather like a disruptor uh, that would kill some companies. Well, and already happened. I mean. Uh, it's I can I can draw a parallel with Google versus Alta Vista if you remember that search engine when Google came then they and uh, people said like why do we need a search engine we have Alta Vista and then it just died after that uh, I think uh, it's super interesting how like uh, the risk 
for some companies if they are not fast enough or bold enough in deploying in their processes, uh, uh, then they will just uh, be left behind simply. And that's kind of on my mind all the time, how to make sure that it's not, like Bjorn said, it's not a lipstick on a pig. You know, we are not just you know putting here and there, but it has to be AI-centric architectures. And changing the architectures is a costly and, I mean, it's a costly process. So you need to be bold enough to make it AI-centric. What do you consider? Is that the next step, going AI-centric? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, exactly that. That would be absolutely rethink the architecture. I mean, I can I can say like uh, for example, we're working on six G architectures. It's an AI centric architecture. Mm -hmm. And it was partly reflected on also yesterday. I think when uh, this whole transition from more of the data towards the model towards the pipeline centric. Um, yeah. So thank you, Elena. Roland, your reflections on a potential showstopper, and then uh, uh, what is next? Yes, uh, very good. I mean, I like the question of uh, if, it's, uh, if uh, companies will be out of business every month. So it's absolutely yes. What we see in the current bids with customers in our industries, uh, they're asking um, equipment efficiency, operator support, that we put this uh, into our products, they provide KPIs to measure the improvements that uh, we deliver with this. We follow this up in our pilot projects at the moment and companies, if they do not see the return of investment, they are not interested in those systems anymore. So those companies that are not able to handle this transition in our domain to work with these multidisciplinary teams uh, to scale uh, the engineering of these systems will be out of business in a few years. I mean, this, this is very clear to me. It's clear in what we see happening on the market um, and so forth. <laughs> What's next? We absolutely need to invest in this uh, scalable software engineering. It's, I agree with Bjorn. It's about the education. It's about uh, bringing researchers, uh, the different disciplines and the domain experts together with business. For me, this is, this is where we need to go. And uh, I put it a little bit different from Elena, this data centric, this is absolutely key. But for us, it's, uh, we, we build network centric systems uh, because the data has to be connected. It has to go from on premises, from the sensors, uh, into the system, into the cloud, back and forth, depending on how long the decisions can take, et cetera. So for us, the data and the network supporting, the network supporting the, data transition, this is key for us. Alexander, showstopper versus next step from your perspective. Yeah, I'm trying to think in a little bit more on in other, other directions as well. We already touched a few technical dimensions here. Um, but one thing that really comes to my mind, which is really um, important, is trust. Um, so the moment the customers lose trust on with, with, with products and the solutions that we offer them, um, you know, as humans, we, that's the moment where things would not work out, in my opinion, anymore. Um, so this loss of trust is something that I see as a showstopper to me, and it's something that we have to be very careful that we always strive forward to it. Um, and in AI, this, um, uh, you know, if we're not careful, this could happen because you probably, you know, heard for AI cases that were, you know, biased towards a certain gender or towards a certain race. Um, so essentially, my point here is that if customers, if users don't have trust in the AI products, this is a showstopper to me. Um, and since you ask about how to solve this moving forward, um, I think one important aspect of this is that really that investment into what are we optimizing for has to be unbiased and inclusive, such as it's empowering everyone, not just specific segments that are maybe overrepresented. Um, so to answer your question shortly, it is all about trust and making sure that AI is inclusive of everyone and research and uh, metrics that are unbiased uh, will help us make sure that this is the future moving forward. Thank you so much, uh, Alexander, for that. Thank you so much, everyone. With uh, regards to the 27 seconds that we have still to go on air, 
I will not dive into any additional question. Instead, I would want to thank everyone in the panel. We are, on behalf of the organizing team, extremely happy to have had you join us to share your experience and expertise. You get thumbs up from people in the audience and I couldn't agree more. So thanks a lot and thanks everyone. Bye.